Welcome to the Food for Your Soul podcast, where we apply the Word of God to the hearts of men and women to stoke the fires of your delight in Christ. When the Jews were given the choice between Jesus and Barabbas, they chose Barabbas, hands down, unanimous, enthusiastic decision, Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. If that trial had happened a thousand years later, in a different culture, different place, different time, the decision they still would have picked Barabbas. And if it happened today, in our time, same result, Barabbas. Why is that? What is it about the natural human heart that prefers someone like Barabbas over Jesus? If we don't know the answer to that question, Why they pick Barabbas? Then we're going to miss one of the most important messages of the whole book of Mark. And when it comes time for us to make a choice like that, we're going to choose the wrong way. So tonight we're going to see why the crowd chose chose Barabbas and what the implications are for our daily lives. Last time we finished chapter 14 of the book of Mark, which is a side-by-side comparison. Remember the split screen of the trials, Jesus' trial and Peter's informal trial? And we saw the contrast. Jesus was confronted by false witnesses and made a true confession. Peter was confronted by true witnesses and made a false confession. Jesus faced the most powerful officials in the nation and stood firm. Peter was questioned by a lowly slave girl and collapsed. Jesus remained silent and refused to defend himself. Peter defended himself with curses and swearing. Everything happened exactly the way Jesus had predicted. Everything happened exactly the opposite of the way Peter had predicted. And then here's the most crucial difference. Everything Peter did was to preserve his life while Jesus was giving up his life. That's the biggest contrast. And that's the, that key principle from chapter 8. In fact, if you've got your Bible, flip back to chapter 8 because we need to refresh our memory on this verse. Mark 8, verse 35. Very key principle for understanding the whole crucifixion scene. Jesus said this, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. When Jesus talks about losing your life to save it and to save your life to lose it, he's talking about two different lives, obviously. One that you're supposed to be willing to lose and another one that you must not lose, that you need to save. The life that we need to be willing to lose is this temporary, temporal, earthly life. The life that we need to make sure we never put at risk is eternal life, right? So just for shorthand, to all that in a compact way, let's just call them big life and little life. Big life is all that God offers us. Little life is all the stuff that would be gone, will be gone the minute we die. All the stuff in this world that we won't have one minute after we die. Little life is this world, big life, kingdom of God. And the whole issue with following Jesus is this question of which one of those you're going to pursue over the other one. You have to forfeit one in order to secure the other. Now let's take a look at how that principle played out in the trial. Jesus' trial before Pilate. So you've seen his trial before the Sanhedrin, now the Romans. In verse 1, Paul, I mean uh, Mark, does something a little out of character for Mark. He, he, he has a bunch of extra verbiage, which he usually doesn't. Usually he's really concise. But look at verse 1. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. Okay, big confab, reached a decision. What was it, Mark? Well, they bound Jesus. Okay, they led him away, literally carried him away. All right, all right. And handed him over. So, okay, all right, made, make a decision, tied him up, carried him off, handed him over. To whom? Spit it out, Mark, what is it? Handed him over to Pilate. What? What on earth? The Jews turned over a matter of great importance to a Gentile court? A Roman court? How often does the Supreme Court of an occupied nation say, you know what? Instead of just handling this matter ourselves, why don't we just go beg our enemies who are oppressing us to decide the matter for us because it's of such great importance? Why on earth would the Jews do that? They hated the Romans. They hated Roman domination. 
Strange as it was, they did it, and it was a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. Mark 10, 33, remember back in chapter 10, Jesus said, The Son of Man will be handed over to, uh, uh, be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn Him to death and will deliver Him to the Gentiles. Very bizarre prophecy when He said it. sounded crazy at the time, but it's exactly what happened. We are about to study tonight the, an absolutely horrific scene, the murder of Jesus, or at least the beginning of it. But Mark keeps reminding us every step of the way by prophecies like, by fulfilled prophecies like this, that the more evil, wicked, vile people do their worst, God's perfect plan is never bumped even one degree off of course. This fits God's purposes to have Jesus tried before the Jews and before the Gentiles because, uh, well, for one thing, you got two different courts with two different systems, two different sets of laws, different interests, and neither court finds anything against Jesus. So it's like God is showing the perfect sinlessness and spotlessness of His Son from every possible angle. So the Jews hand Jesus over to Pilate. What's the significance of that for Mark? I mean, we just look at this text and say, like, what, why is that important for Mark? And you, and you find out right away as soon as you look at verse 2. Because verse 1, they bound Jesus, led him away, handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. <laughs> now, does that sound, does strike you as a little abrupt? Just suddenly we're in the middle of the trial. I mean, he skips past the whole process, the preliminaries, the charges, the first half of the trial, everything just skips right to the middle of the trial, right to this point where... Pilate asked Jesus this one question, are you the king of the Jews? And of all the accusations they made, we know they made a bunch, this is the only one Mark tells us about. We don't even know what the other one, no, other gospels tells us what the other ones are, but Mark, he, he, this is the only one he wants to tell, tell us about. And if you question whether that's important, I mean, that enough tells me that it's important. King of the Jews, Mark's got that. He wants us to dial in, okay, king of the Jews is important somehow. And if you miss that, uh, you're going to see it again. You just read the next several verses, you're going to see the phrase King of the Jews a half a dozen times just in the next several verses. Mark's never used that phrase the whole time in the gospel, the whole gospel until now. And all of a sudden, six times, King of the Jews, King of the Jews, King of the Jews. Mark's making a point that Israel voluntarily handed their king over to the Gentiles. Now, obviously the Priests don't really believe Jesus is their king, and neither does Pilate, neither do the soldiers. It's all mockery. It's all. Uh, but, but remember, all through this whole thing, if you can think back to last time, everything Mark is doing here is teaching us a lot through irony. Remember, irony is when the spoken, the words that the characters speak have a lot more meaning to the reader than the characters meant. And so th that's what's going on here. King of the Jews is exactly what Jesus was. The reader of Mark knows that. When Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, was last time was accusing Jesus of blasphemy, we saw that it was reversed. Caiaphas turned out to be the blasphemer, and Jesus turned out to be the true high priest. Now Jesus stands before Pilate, and there he is, bound in chains, under arrest. And yet, guess who's the real sovereign in this scene, and who's the real prisoner? We're going to watch and see that Jesus does exactly as He planned, exactly what He wills, and Pilate is forced to do the opposite of everything he wants to do. Jesus is the real king, Pilate's the real prisoner. So for thousands of years, the Jews have been waiting for this king. God promised this messianic king who's going to come and be the fulfillment of all of the promises of the Old Testament, this amazing thing. And they've been waiting for thousands of years, waiting, waiting. Finally, God gives them that king. They look him up and down and say, ah, oh, no thanks, and kick him off to the Gentiles. That's what's happening here. Back in chapter 12, Jesus told that parable of the vineyard where he said the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from the Jews and given to the Gentiles, and now we see why. It's because they re reject the king. You reject the king, you lose the kingdom. And I think one reason why Mark is so, uses so much verbiage in, in verse 1 is to highlight how deliberate this decision was to give up their king to the Gentiles. It wasn't in the heat of the moment. It wasn't that they just got caught up in a frenzy without really thinking it through. This was a premeditated, carefully considered, deliberate choice. We don't want this king. 
He came to his own and his own did not receive him. The, the stone the builders rejected became the capstone of the kingdom of God. This section that we're studying tonight is the account where the builders do that. They examine this cornerstone and reject it. And they reject, in doing so, they lose the whole kingdom and it's given to the Gentiles. Of all the questions Pilate asks Jesus, this one's the only one he responds to, the whole trial. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus' answer was remarkable. It's something, it's something the church never forgot. In fact, when Paul later on wants to really get Timothy's attention, he's given him a charge and he says, I want, I'm going to invoke this solemn charge and I, I want Timothy to listen to this. When he does that, he invokes this moment of Jesus standing before Pilate. 1 Timothy 6.13, he says, In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you. And he goes on and gives the charge. So this confession, Jesus making this confession before Pilate, is right, it's, it's right up there with God giving life to all things. This, is, this answer here is not a small moment. So what, what's the answer? What's the answer? Well, probably translated different ways in your Bibles because it's difficult to translate. We know it's an affirmative answer. It's a colloquialism. And colloquialisms, if you don't live in that culture, it's tough to know what they mean. We know that it's an affirmative answer. It's a yes answer because the other Gospels say Jesus said yes. Right? So we know, we know that much. Um, thanks, other Gospels, for decoding that for us. But... When we get to John, we find out it's kind of a yes, but. Yes, I'm the king of the Jews, but not like you're thinking, Pilate. Uh, you got the right words, wrong meaning. Right words, wrong understanding of those words. Wrong how? Well, like I said, we get more detail in John. I'll read it. John 18, 36. Uh, Pilate asked the question, and Jesus said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest from the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You, you're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, this is the reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Yes, I'm a king, but the kingdom of God, it's a kingdom of God, not a kingdom in this world. It's not any threat to Rome. It's not the kind of kingdom where I'm raising an army, but it is the kingdom of God. That was the good confession. Pointing to the kingdom of God instead of trying to defend himself, um, trying to save his life. That was a good confession, but it's good as it was. It's not what amazed Pilate. What really amazed Pilate was what Jesus didn't say. Because that answer is the last thing Jesus says. He's done talking. Silence from here on out for Jesus. Verse 3, the chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. He was amazed that Jesus wouldn't defend himself because in Roman law, if a defendant wouldn't defend himself, he was presumed guilty. And this is a capital trial. There's plenty of chatter going on in the room. Chief priests are going on, making all their accusations. Pilate's asking questions. Witnesses are testifying. None of that impresses Pilate. The only amazing element to this whole thing was the silence of Jesus. Only Jesus can captivate everyone and astonish kings by saying nothing. Part of what made the good confession good was the good silence that followed. His confession of the truth wasn't diluted by a bunch of self-defense and arguing over lesser issues and, and accusations. So by remaining silent, this is Jesus once again choosing to drink that cup. You know how many times Jesus had to choose that? I mean, he chose it in Gethsemane. He said, okay, Father, I'll drink the cup. And then again, in the, when he was silent in the first trial, and then silent in the next trial, and silent in this trial, he has to keep making this decision to drink the cup. Because at any moment, he can call those 12 legions of angels, right? But he's letting go of little life in favor of big life. That's what's happening here. He's giving an example for us. Same thing he taught him back in chapter 13. Don't think of courtrooms anymore as places of justice. Think of courtrooms as opportunities to present, proclaim the gospel to the authorities. That's what courtrooms are for now, from now on. And Jesus is our example. So now, starting in verse 6, 
we have this really rare moment in the gospel where someone besides Jesus takes center stage. Think about how rare that is. We don't see that. I mean, from here, we don't, we're not going to see Jesus do or say anything all, from now until he cries out on the cross. Normally, all through the gospel, the camera is just trained on Jesus wherever he goes. And the only time you see any other people is when they come close to Jesus, right? But not now. Now, he takes the camera off Jesus because it's important to Mark that we get a really clear view of the people who killed Jesus and why they did it. Everybody, and I, we, we saw this last time, everybody that tries Jesus ends up being the ones actually on trial. Because you judge yourself by how you judge Jesus. Uh, last time it was the Sanhedrin. They tried Jesus, came up guilty. They uh, are indicted again in this passage. In fact, if you skip down to verse 9, uh, Pilate says, Do you want me to release you, the king of the Jews? Knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests handed Jesus over to them. So Mark tells us what Pilate knew, which, which is... This had nothing to do with justice, had nothing to do with religion, had nothing to do with blasphemy, anything like that. They just hated Jesus because they were envious of Him. Envious of what? His amazing relationship with God? No. His perfect moral purity? No. His wisdom? No. The thing they so envied was the one thing Jesus had that really wasn't very valuable, His popularity. I mean, where did that get Jesus? They coveted that so much, it drove them to, into a murderous rage, and that's why they killed Jesus. They were, they were envious of his popularity. So that's the priest. We know they're guilty. Um, next up on trial is the crowd. Now, you're judged by your judgment of Jesus, so what was their verdict on Jesus? That's what we're going to look at now, verse 6. Now, it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison. Now, that is an amazing name. I think the reader would see this like, Barabbas? You've got to be kidding. Barabbas? That's his name? I'll tell you why in just a second. Mark is famous for not naming names, right? He doesn't even tell us that it's Peter with the sword. I mean, he doesn't name names, but here he wants us to know this guy's name. And I'll show you why in a minute. But first, let's just look at this guy's rap sheet. Verse 7, a man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. So this guy was involved with, in a violent insurrection against Rome. Verse 8, the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So they come and say, hey, Pilate, you know that prisoner amnesty thing you do on Passover? Uh, will you do that again this year? And so verse 9, Pilate says, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest handed Jesus over to him. So it's because he knows it was out of envy that he asks this question. He knows Jesus isn't guilty of anything. And that this is all just a big personal vendetta on the part of the Pilate's not dumb. He knows this. He can see what's going on here. He knows it's just a vendetta. And he's probably okay with killing Jesus. But before he does that, before he kills Jesus in order to make the priest happy, he's got to ask, is this going to cause a problem? Is there going to be an uprising? Because Jesus is popular. I mean, he had to know about Jesus' popularity. Jesus is the most popular, most famous person in the nation. Um, so before putting him to death, Pilate wants to feel out the crowd. Is this going to be a problem if I, if I go along with what the priests want? And so, as a reader of Mark, the reader of Mark at this point is going to say, oh, of course the crowd's going to pick Jesus. They've been his fans the whole time, right? That's why the chief priests could never do anything to Jesus. They're always afraid of the crowds having a riot. So you expect them to say, just shout, yeah, release Jesus, give us Jesus. But they don't. Why? Why? Well, verse 11. The chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. Now, the chief priests were never able to win the crowd over before. They always tried to, but they, they were never able to pull it off. But now, with Jesus standing there in chains, all beaten black and blue and weak and seemingly defeated, a Roman prisoner, well, now they're able to do it. They're able to win these crowds over and say, look, you don't want him. 
They win them over, not so much by bad-mouthing Jesus, but by pointing the crowd to a better alternative, Barabbas. Barabbas was a very popular figure. And he was popular because he was a perfect fit for the kind of deliverer that Israel wanted. He was just the right kind of guy, a strong, violent, military leader who could raise a resistance against Rome, wasn't afraid to take it to Rome, Rome, uh, take it to Rome and, and return Israel to her glory days of independence. That's what the Jews wanted, and that's what Barabbas was all about. And so the priests, you know, kind of point that out. They're behind all this. They're stirring all this up. Uh, so, the, so it's their fault, but it's the, the crowd's culpable too. And that's important to understand. The crowd was stirred up by the leaders, but they shouldn't have been so easily stirred up. Right? It's a good thing to remember when you're part of a crowd. Don't be easily stirred up. It takes courage to resist the pressure of strong, insistent leaders. You, know, you get a leader, and he's just really charismatic and really strong and really confident. It's hard to just not follow him, especially when everyone else is following him. It takes a lot of backbone. But hard or not, God holds us responsible to follow his way, regardless of how much pressure there is from the crowd or the leaders or anybody. It's, it's, we're responsible. And so this crowd is culpable, and they're not just a little bit culpable. Uh, they turn absolutely bloodthirsty. Look at verse 12. I mean, we'll get to this again in a minute, but what shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Man, that is cold. I mean, the, the crowd could have just said, we don't care what you do with him. Just give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. So as long as you give us Barabbas, we're happy. Or they could have said, ah, yeah, we don't like him. Give him a whipping, you know, and let him go or something. But instead, they call for the most savage, dehumanizing, torturous, humiliating death possible. And they just sound like a bunch of crazed, demonized monsters at this point. <laughs> because they were. You know, a lot of times people think that the common people are generally good. Like, that's a fundamental assumption behind Marxism. Like, that's Marxism. The common, regular, working class, common folk, poor people, the oppressed, they're the good guys. Uh, not true. Not true. They're just as bent as, and broken as the people in power. And if you give, get them into a mob where they actually have some power, you'll see it. You'll see they're just as cruel and inhumane as the people in power. And the Jews kind of give themselves away a little bit here. It's kind of funny. They brought Jesus to Pilate under the pretense that they're concerned about Rome, right? Oh, Pilate, we're so loyal to Rome. We just had to tell you, there's this guy and he's, he's disloyal to Rome. He's an insurrectionist and, oh boy, you're going to have to watch him. We just want to turn him in because we're loyal Roman uh, subjects. That's why you're turning Jesus in. Then the first chance they get, they say, yeah, release Barabbas, an actual insurrectionist. <laughs> so, they, yeah, they kind of give themselves away a little bit. The truth is, the reason they're accusing Jesus of rebelling against Rome is because they're mad at him for refusing to rebel against Rome. Right? They wanted him to be a Barabbas. They, they wanted Jesus to be a political, military messiah. Jesus refused to be a political, military messiah, and so they handed over to Pilate and accused him, this guy's a political, military messiah. So the people of Israel got a clear choice. And this is where the name Barabbas comes in. You know, I said it's bizarre that his name would be Barabbas. He, he, Mark already told us what, the, what Bar means, right? Son of, we learned that with Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. And he showed us in the garden what Abba means, right? Abba, Father. Bar, Abbas, means son of Abba, Father. There just happens to be a guy in prison named Son of Abba, Father. <laughs> this is immediately after Jesus just testified in the last trial to be the Son of God, and he prayed in the garden to... God and called him Abba Father in Gethsemane. And this guy's name is Bar Abbas. And Barabbas is his last name. Uh, some reliable manuscripts tell us his first name was Jesus. Jesus Bar Abbas. 
So Mark is setting this up as a very clear, clear choice between two messiahs. That's the point. Take your pick. Jesus, son of the earthly Abba, or Jesus who calls God Abba? Which Jesus do you want? Which Messiah do you want? So he wants us to understand, Mark wants us to understand, this is an alternative Messiah. Barabbas is an alternative Messiah to Jesus. We're about in a couple days to vote for who we want for our governor. These people got to vote, this generation of Jews got to vote, cast their vote for which candidate would be their savior. They can pick the hate your enemy macho Jesus who will take it to Rome right now or the love your enemy meek Jesus who talks about a spiritual kingdom. That first guy, tough guy, the macho Jesus, definitely the one you want if you're concerned about this little life. That other Jesus, he's more big life oriented. So the choice is presented to them. It's an easy choice for them. Unanimous by acclamation, give us Barabbas. Uh, Pilate didn't have to count for a recount um, and say that's a close one. No, it was like, nope. That's very clear. Everybody agrees, give us Barabbas. And that's the choice that Israel picked. And that's the path they followed for the next three decades. After Jesus died, they... They started following these Barabbas insurrectionist types for the next three decades until it finally blew up into full-blown civil war with Rome in AD 66. And by AD 70, Rome came and crushed them and the Jewish population in an absolute bloodbath. What did Jesus say about preserving the little life? You start to save this life, you will lose it. Leads to death. Leads to death. That's what happens when you choose a little life or big life, you get death. He wants to save his little life, will lose it. But whoever loses his little life, for me and for the gospel, Jesus says, will get big life, eternal life. Okay, so that's the crowd. Crowd comes up guilty. Uh, Sanhedrin guilty, Jewish population guilty. Next up, Pilate, verse 9. Pilate says, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Knowing it was out of envy that they handed him over. Now, that should have been the end of it right there, right? If he was any kind of just judge at all, if he had one just bone in his body, he should have said, I'm not going to kill an innocent man because you guys are envious. Get lost, right? That's what should have happened here. But, uh, and you know, some people, I, I point this because some people, I read commentary after commentary that said, oh, the Pilate was, is portrayed favorably here. I mean, at least he was trying to release Jesus. No, he wasn't. He wasn't trying to. Pilate had full authority to release Jesus anytime he wanted. All he has to do is say, not guilty. And he's, gone. he's released. He doesn't need this, the crowd to go along with this amnesty thing to release Jesus. He can just release Jesus all he wants. But Pilate wants to please the crowd. And so he comes up with this amnesty thing, this choice, uh, between Jesus and Barabbas. And they choose Barabbas. But even though they choose Barabbas, that kind of, you'd think I'd alarm Pilate a little bit. He'd have to maybe say, well, Barabbas, uh, boy, he's, I mean, he's actually an insurrectionist. He doesn't say a word about Barabbas. He doesn't even care about, he, his, fix, he, his attention is just fixed on Jesus. He's just like, Barabbas, what shall I, verse 12, what shall I do then with this one you call the king of the Jews? Well, that's a stupid question to ask a rabble mob. What shall I do? Do your job, Pilate. Don't ask the crowd. If you're just going to turn the decision over to some rabble lynch mob, what's the point of even having law courts? But he looks, he, he puts it to the crowd. And like I said before, their, their response is absolutely shocking. Crucify him. Crucify. And Pilate's response is, why? Why? Uh, why would the Jews want one of their own to be crucified by the Romans. The Jews hated that. And it's not even the normal, I mean, the normal mode of execution for the Romans was not crucifixion, it was beheading. And not even all insurrectionists were crucified. Um, they might be banished to an island, thrown to lions, a different thing. Crucifixion 
was reserved only for the most extreme cases where the R Roman government says, we have to send a big time message to terrify the population. This guy is a threat. He's going to raise an army. We need to just put this out. And so they would take the guy, strip him naked, torture him in the most brutal, bloody ways, hang him up on a pole, and do it along a major thoroughfare, along a major road, right on I-25. So the maximum number of people would see him, and they would leave his body up there for days, and, and even after he's dead, and just let the vultures and critters just pick at the body and the most dehumanizing humility and it would be such a gruesome horrific traumatizing thing to see that the general population would be so terrified to never even consider ever doing what that guy did that's the purpose of crucifixion was to send a message like that so why did the jews want jesus crucified i mean the jews killed people by stoning or other ways strangling in different ways but not 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 this why do this? If the purpose of crucifixion was to send a message, were they trying to send a message? Well, I think probably the chief priests were. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Jesus had embarrassed them, defied their authority, showed them up in front of all the people. Worst of all, he took the thing that they prized the most, which was popularity. So it could be just like, don't, don't anybody ever think you're going to try and do what Jesus did to us. This is what will happen to you. It's one possibility. Another possibility is they wanted Jesus to be cursed by God because Deuteronomy 21, 23 says anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. They didn't just want Jesus rejected by the people. They wanted him repudiated by God himself. And that proved to be an effective strategy going forward for preventing future Jews from ever following Jesus, because in 1 Corinthians 1.23 it says, Paul said, we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews. Jews can't, they can't get past this. The Messiah crucified by the Romans doesn't compute. So the strategy worked out pretty good there for the chief priests. So they want Jesus crucified. And Pilate is baffled, verse 13. Crucify him, they shouted. He's like, why? What crime has he committed? Now, when Pilate asked that, you can see he's not convinced of any of their charges, not even the king of the Jews one. You know, some people say, well, the king of the Jews, that was, you know, that, that was a reason to execute him because he's claiming to be a sovereign. And, but once he got Jesus' answer about that, king of another world and all that, he wasn't worried about that. He's like, no, there's no crime. There's no crime. What crime has he committed? The Jews are going to have to come up with some more persuasive argument than what they've come up with before. So he asked for that. So here it comes. Here's their persuasive. Verse 14, why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. <laughs> so you can always tell when somebody doesn't have a good argument when they just get louder. <laughs> all right, so, so here's the big test for Pilate. Pilate's on trial. God gave him his position as judge so that he would carry out justice. Punish guilty people, protect innocent people. That's what government officials are supposed to do. When you vote, vote for that. This is Pilate's God-given role, and that's what the government is pay the Roman government is paying him for as well to, to do justice. So that's what he's supposed to do. But he's afraid of an uprising because that could threaten his job security. And so he decided to appease the crowd, verse 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd. Boy, those are condemning words. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. Proverbs 17, 15 says, Acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent, the Lord detests them both. The Lord hates them both. Pilate did them both in one shot right here at this trial. He acquits the guilty and condemns the innocent. And it's just kind of amazing how all the parties involved in this whole scene just twist themselves up in trying to deal with Jesus. They're all doing, the governor is asking to be governed by the Jews. The Roman governor is saying to the Jews, hey, tell me what to do. And the Jews are saying, no, 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 crucify one of our own, go ahead. And, and it's like everybody is so intent on perpetrating this evil that they're twisting themselves and doing the exact opposite of what they would normally do. 
Pilate is driven by his subjects. The crowd is driven by the chief priests. The priests are driven by envy. Only Jesus stands unharried, unpressured, in full command of everything he says and does in carrying out the Father's will. Unruffled. You know, in the movies, the villains are always really like super powerful, right? They got, they got to be, it would be a boring movie. But in real life, the most dangerous villains are typically weak men in positions of power. They have big smiles, zero spine. Those are the dangerous people. And they get elected because they're really good at pleasing everybody. But once they're in power, they're incredibly dangerous because they'll go wherever the mob pushes them because they're all about pleasing everybody. Those are dangerous people. They will not protect you when the mob comes after you. And this happens in churches. You know, if the crowd doesn't get what, it's want, what it wants in the church, they'll start leaving, which puts the pastor's job at risk. And so if they want less repentance teaching and more funny stories, guess what they're going to get? Less repentance and more funny stories. I think there are going to be congregations they are going to have to answer on Judgment Day for the fact that Past unfaithful pastors have jobs in their churches, and faithful pastors don't have jobs because that was the demand of the congregation. There's no demand for faithful preaching, and there's a huge demand for tickling ears. Uh, congregations will have to answer to God, but those preachers will also have to answer to God. Those ones that, with no backbone, will be held responsible on Judgment Day because they're just like Pilate. They're doing just the same thing Pilate did. Why does Pilate try so hard to give Jesus am amnesty? He wasn't trying to give Jesus amnesty. He was trying to give himself amnesty. He wants this off his conscience. Matthew 27, 24, Pilate took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. Yeah, that's not really how it works, Pilate. <laughs> when you're guilty, protests of innocence don't make you innocent. They only make you more guilty. The only path towards cleaning that spot out of your soul is confession of your guilt, not prof pro professing innocence and pretending your hands are clean. So who deserves the blame for killing Jesus? Who killed Jesus? Everybody. Everybody. It's kind of fashionable for scholars to accuse the gospel writers of anti-Semitism because they say, oh, the gospel writers, they just go out of their way to make the Jews so guilty and so culpable, and then they paint Pilate in more kind of a favorable light. That argument is just bizarre to me. Anti-Semitic? They were Jews. The gospel writers were Jews. If it's anti-Semitic to point out the rebellion of the Jews against God, then the entire Old Testament is anti-Semitic. What Old Testament book doesn't condemn the Jews at the time for rebelling against God? Is the book of Judges anti-Semitic? They just certainly don't look very good there. It's ridiculous to say they're anti-Semitic. And it's equally ridiculous to say that the Gospel writers portrayed Pilate in a positive light. Positive? I mean, look again at what he does to a man he knows is innocent. He knows is unjustly accused. Verse 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Now, we just ate, so I'll refrain from the gruesome detail of flogging and crucifixion and all, or you know it, you know this. But I will say this, the Roman flogging was a lot more savage than the Jewish 39 lashes. The Romans had no number limit, and the scourging lacerated and stripped the flesh, often exposing bones and leaving entrails hanging out. This was just common after a Roman flogging. Many men died during the flogging. To do that to an innocent man who did nothing but good to everybody he met is unforgivable. And it, he didn't just have him flogged. It wasn't just the flogging after that. Crucifixion, which is, which is designed to be even worse physical torture, 
but not just physical, with the most degrading humiliation. It was designed to dehumanize the person and create not only the most extreme physical pain, but also the most extreme emotional anguish and completely crush the person's spirit. That's how it was designed. Pilate was a monster. And he's portrayed as a monster in the Gospels. Favorable light. I can't even... Some people say, well, doesn't verse 5 portray him as favorable because he's amazed at Jesus? No. We've seen this all through Mark. What is amazement in Mark? It's, all, it's never an adequate response to Jesus, right? The crowds are always amazed. Anytime someone's amazed at Jesus, it's never, it's never a positive thing if that's all, as far as it goes. Pilate, should, once he was amazed, he should have looked further into it. Instead of saying, ah, I think I'll just have him flogged and crucified and then go on his merry way. Pilate walked right past the glimmers of light that could have saved him from eternal ruin. Well, next time we'll see the Roman soldiers and their monsters too. Every single character in this story bears blame for Jesus' death. The Jewish leadership, the crowd, Pilate, the soldiers, Judas, Peter, the disciples, all of them. Everybody. Who's guilty of killing Jesus? Mankind. Does the Bible give special emphasis to the Jewish role? Of course it does. <laughs> of course, it, not because they're, the, there's anything special about that, except that their guilt is emphasized more because their guilt was more theologically significant, because they're rejecting the Jewish Messiah. Of course the Jews are going to be focused on. But nobody ex escapes blame. And it's worth noting, and here's where this starts to hit us, it's worth noting that the sins that led to the murder of Jesus were mostly what we would consider small sins. People commit these sins in the church as no scandal. We'll laugh it off. For Judas, simple love of money. Just the love of money. Peter, fear of embarrassment. The chief priests, envy. Pilate, desire for job security. The crowd, desire to make Israel great again. Right? They wanted to be a strong nation. None of those sound like big scandalous sins. Nobody's ever been kicked out of a church for any of those sins. But they all have one thing in common. They're all examples of preferring little life over big life. There's nothing wrong with wanting, a job, wanting job security, uh, but when you put that above justice, you've chosen little life over big life. There's nothing wrong with patriotism and wanting Israel to be independent and great, whatever, but when they choose the tough macho Messiah who would put the nation of Israel on top here and now rather than Jesus who will bring about eternal glory, that's choosing little life over big life. Peter couldn't stand the thought of a stranger looking down on him, especially one of the opposite sex. Looking good in the moment meant more to him than honoring the king of kings. That's little, light, little tiny life over big life. The chief priests, they wanted the fame and influence that Jesus enjoyed more than they wanted favor in the eyes of God. That's little life over big life. All these desires in and of themselves aren't evil. It's fine to desire the components of little life. It's okay to want that. But when that rises above the desire for big life, it becomes as evil and wicked and dark as the human soul can get, even to the point of murdering the Son of God. All right, so... You can see why most of the time Mark keeps our attention on Jesus. Because <laughs> when we move over to look at people, it can be pretty depressing. So let's just close by turning our attention back to Jesus here for a minute. All through this message, I've been using this big life, little life shorthand. But let's remember the biblical wording, Mark 8.35. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. 
While everyone around him was grasping for little life, Jesus was laying down his little life. Right? That's what's going on. Peter had promised Jesus. Remember, he said, even if, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. But Jesus knew that they would fail. They would disown him because they hadn't yet learned what it means to let go of this little life. And that was the very reason why Jesus had to let, lay down his life. Peter said, I'll die for you, Jesus. And Jesus might have responded, you know, that's true, Peter. You eventually will die for me, but not before I die for you first. All this evil that we've looked at tonight is why Jesus had to die. including Peter's. We didn't talk about this back when we were talking about Peter, but I'll just throw it in here. Um, how many of you have been hurt by people in the church? Like, like <laughs> no one in this world has ever hurt me as deeply as people in the church have hurt me and my family. How should we respond to that? By retreating and trying to protect what's left of our little life? Or by following Jesus' example. If you've been hurt by the church, Jesus can relate to that. Because in this whole crucifixion account with all these vile, wicked people, who slandered Christ the worst? The most vicious, vile repudiation of Christ in this whole ordeal came from the mouth of Peter. It wouldn't surprise me if you asked Jesus, hey, in that whole crucifixion thing, what was the most painful moment of the whole thing? It wouldn't surprise me if he said, oh, man, to listen to my chief disciple and close friend curse and swear that he never knew who I was. That was no fun. If you've, ever, if you've been hurt by the church, that's nothing new. If you think that's a sign of modern church has gone off the rails, <laughs> no, it wasn't like that with the early church. It doesn't get any earlier than Peter at the cross, right? <laughs> Jesus went through what you went, you've gone through, treated horribly by the church, treated horribly by leadership in the church. What did Jesus do? Turn his back? No. Withdraw? No. Died for them. What should you do when somebody in the church stabs you in the back? Overlook it? No, can't overlook it. It's a serious matter. The way to handle it is the way Jesus did. You say, this is serious. This is such a serious problem, so serious that I am willing to lay down my life and die if necessary to improve this situation. Peter had to learn that it was not only necessary for Jesus to die, but he, Peter, was the reason why Jesus had to die. Jesus had to die for sins because even the, most, the best of mankind... The Apostle Peter would qualify. The best of mankind is hopelessly wicked and in need of substitute sacrifice to avoid being punished in hell. That's why Jesus had to die. And now, when we re receive eternal life, big life from Him through His resurrection, we can afford to lay down our little life for the sake of those who hurt us. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for giving us big life, giving us that which can't be taken from us, that which is so valuable, it's worth laying down everything in this little life. Open our eyes to see the difference between little and big. We ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Any questions? healed from being Jesus healed from right. and it wasn't the it wasn't the entire nation who was there obviously the whole yeah. you know that whole nation isn't there at this scene it's a crowd it's not the it's not necessarily the same individuals as other crowds but semantically when he mark keeps using the word crowd 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 that word represents israel as a whole so even though it's not the same individuals it is representative of the population so I think it's accurate to say the population, that generation rejected Christ, even though we know that not all of them did. Um, 
The disciples didn't, the followers of Jesus, 120. No, I hadn't, but I hadn't, but it's, it makes perfect sense. It's the way it happens today, you know, so. You can't come in, you can't I mean, it's just speculation. It's just, there's nothing in the Bible that says that, but it's. I imagine it would be difficult to find people that are Barabbas' soldiers, like, hey, you want your leader back? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because Barabbas, it, I mean, Matthew tells us Barabbas was famous. He was a famous guy, and he would have been popular, so. Um, when, when, G, when, Pilate offers um, Barabbas or Jesus. The whole point of an amnesty thing, of release of a prisoner, was to gain the favor of the people, right? So he's not going to offer them somebody they don't care about. He's going to offer them somebody really popular. So we know he, he was. He was a popular leader. So, yeah. so yeah, you're right. Probably a bunch of Bar Barabbasites were on hand. Why well, think that he listened to his wife? His wife had a dream. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, that wasn't it marked. I mean, there's so much of this that are in the other Gospels, yeah. and it took me forever just to get to cover what Mark said. So it's tough to. But yeah, Mrs. Pilate had a dream and said, don't have anything to do with this. <laughs> so it's kind of, you, you kind of wonder if uh, God was giving Pilate a chance to say, hey, this is, you need to look into this. Listen to your wife. And they did the typical thing. It's a marriage class. <laughs> didn't listen. That's what happens when you don't listen to your wife. You end up crucifying the Son of God. He didn't get in trouble for this. He did get in trouble for another riot that happened, another uprising, and he lost his position. He almost lost his position prior to this because of an uprising. So he was, he was careful about uprisings. Yeah, yeah, and I, I heard one guy say that, um, you know, he was the longest reigning leader uh, in that position of anybody ever, by far. And <clears throat> one person suggested that might not have been because of his amazing leadership ability, because it wasn't a great post. Yeah. Having yeah. Judea, that's kind of like a, a Russian leader getting <laughs> Siberia or something, yeah. you know, it's like... So the fact that he's there that many years might mean he was, he was on the bottom of the list for a long time. Made someone mad. Yeah. Barabbas' first name was Jesus. Do you think Gamaliel was talking about him in Acts? As he, these things come and go, and he was supposedly... I'd never heard his first name was Jesus. So I there's like, another. There's another Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was a super common name. So, but there's another insurrectionist named Jesus that I think that uh, was what he was talking about. So I don't think that would have been Jesus Barabbas. So the the Jesus Barabbas thing that's in Matthew, and it's in some manuscripts. None of the main major translations have it in their main text. But it's likely, it's pretty, there's pretty strong arguments that it was in the original. Um, it's not, the reason they don't put it in the main, main, main translations is because it wasn't in very many manuscripts. It's kind of a small number, but it, it kind of died out early on in the manuscript tradition. But the reason it died out uh, was church fathers, I forget which church father, Origen or somebody was, said, we know this couldn't be the original because no evil person would ever be named Jesus. <laughs> that logic, the fact that he used that logic is what convinces a lot of scholars, I think it was in the original. <laughs> you know, if they're having to use argument, resort to arguments like that. So, yeah, so I, I, there's a lot of pretty significant scholars that would say yeah, we think that it was, it was in the original. It's not in Mark, but... You know, Mark always does everything in an abbreviated way, but the, just the name, the fact that Mark gives us the name, Bar Abbas, right after he made the big, you know, he never mentions the word Abba all through the book, and then right before this, Jesus prays to Abba Father. And then this guy happens to be named Son of Abba Father. It's pretty clear what Mark's doing. Thank you for listening. We pray these principles from the Word of God are helping you find the peace of God as you draw near to the God of peace. Please remember to pray for this ministry, and remember that we're a crowd-funded ministry, so every gift helps. Just go to treasuringgod.com. Until next time, rejoice in the Lord always and set your mind on things above, 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God.